I want you to know that tomorrow is a special event in this church and the community. We are holding our community block party and starts at 2 p.m. I want you to, to be part of that. Come and be part of our ministry to, to our community. We want to make sure that after several years now of doing this that we'll be able to, to invite the uh, people from, from our neighbors. Secondly, I want you to know that we emphasize this is a special ministry in the summer vacation Bible school. And it's a special ministry for the young people. But I want you to know that we're also we're doing is we're adding a positive parenting seminar and inviting the community for this. So please, uh, parents, uh, take part of this and be, be involved. And finally, the health weekend focus on July 18 and 20. We have something going on left and right. And you don't want to miss also especially the... The event on the health week and we have special guests that are coming and look into your bulletin for more information or the uh, the website Seems like news around the world will hit The headlines and this is what grabbed me today when I saw that the Iraqi troops are now doing a counterattack an offensive against the ISIS forces. They're going to the northern uh, Baghdad, the Tikrit, and they're, they're positioning themselves to be able to, to, to fight off all this, uh, this, uh, this insurgents that are trying to take over uh, their country. One of the other things that I also note, besides turmoil in different places of the world, it would be natural disasters that are taking place. This time in India, monsoon has taken place. So far, it has killed 11 people and many more are, are thought to have perished with this. And if it's not monsoon, record monsoons, it will be a tornado. It will be some other kind of climactic disasters or weather patterns that they said they can't explain. But we know, ladies and gentlemen, these are signs of the soon coming of Jesus, right? These are signs that we shouldn't be surprised because you're seeing them on the headlines. It's not just once a week, but every day there's something in the news that you can see Jesus is coming soon. Every day that you come and realize, what am I doing to prepare for that soon coming of the Lord? When you come here every week to worship God, you are here to prepare for the soon coming of Jesus. You are more than just, by your attendance here, it is what the Holy Spirit works and does in your life, in your heart. Amen? Pray with me. Father in heaven, we need your presence right now. We need your Holy Spirit, and I pray for the anointing and baptism of your Holy Spirit upon this place, upon every individual here. Oh, Lord, I pray also for, for you to use me as your instrument. And uh, the people behind me, give them, their Father, the words, what to say. We, are, we humble ourselves before you because unless you speak through us and in us, we have nothing to share. We claim this promise, Lord, and we give you praise. I ask you now to bind the enemy and cast him out. He's now welcome here. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hold up your Bibles with me, friends, and say it together. Hold up your Bibles. If you're using an iPhone, put up that iPhone too. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you believe it? Amen. 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 Our message today is entitled, The Millennials Connecting to America's Largest Generation. Several months ago, we were holding a series right here in this sanctuary. I remember preaching, I remember the Holy Spirit saying, make a call, make an appeal. And I believe the prophecy given by Joel chapter 2, it says here, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out what? My spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy, your old men and shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Amen. Now, 
Joel was writing as a prophet pointing to many generations, centuries later. And you know what? That's talking about our time. So here, as, I was, as the Holy Spirit impressed me, making an appeal, I remember making an appeal. I remember making an appeal to, for those who want to be baptized to come forward, for those who want God to, to change their lives. But you know what? We had the congregation standing up. I don't know if you remember that event, but no one came forward until one child came forward, came to the front. Another child came to the front until we had almost 11 to 12 kids coming to the front. If you remember, there was such an awe in the whole place. We knew the Holy Spirit was moving upon the hearts of these boys and girls. From that point on, establish a Bible study class right after church that would meet in the youth room. And Juliet Santos, uh, along with the help of um, Matthew and Gracie and Elder Gibran, would meet with them. And now, this is only part of the class or part of the group that's here today, but they have something exciting to say. Now I'm going to give the microphone for the next few minutes to Juliet as she will share what's going to take place here. Thank you, uh, Pastor, for doing that. And I hope everybody can hear me. I think I've got my microphone turned on. Is this working? Okay. Is this working now? All right. Does this one work? Awesome. So, so what we've done is basically prepared a special little something for the kids that will help them to learn more about God in a fun way. And so our Bible studies began in a little room in the back, and all we did was we would come right before potluck or right after church, and we would talk about God, and we would talk about the Bible, and they had all their lesson studies done. They would do those at home, but then they would bring their questions to us during this time. So today, typically, what we would do is meet right after church, And it would be um, right before, actually even before they started the fellowship meal, the kids would go grab their food, would sit around a table, would eat, and we'd just have a conversation. It's nothing formal, but it sure is something that is not stressful to them. And so today, instead of that class, we're actually going to have our session here for you up here so that you parents can understand and can hear what kinds of things we're talking about in our uh, class for kids in discipleship, K-I-D-S, get it? Okay, nobody got that. Kids in discipleship, K-I-D-S, okay? So kids. And there's actually a program developed by one of our friends that is Kids in Discipleship. However, today we just want to show you how the conversations flow in, these, in this room and um, what your kids are asking and how we're training them not just to learn about God but how to speak of their testimony when their friends ask them, what do you think of God? How come you're praying in school? And what is it about you guys that's different from everybody else? So good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good. Good? So, so how, what was great during your, your week? You're going to have to move your hair there. I can't see your face, sweetie, your beautiful face. There you go. So how was your week? Tell me how your week was. Okay. Okay. How, how did God bless you this week? Mm. You, can all, you can all just speak up. You have microphones. How did God bless you? I know I can barely keep you quiet back there, so don't be quiet up here now, okay? I went to um, ICC, and it was really fun, and we learned more about God there, and it helped me learn what God has to tell us, and the theme was that Jesus was always by your side. Awesome. Thank you. How did did you guys, um, how did you guys take God into your life this week. Did you do that? Were you able to do that this week? Did you take God to school with you? How did you do that? Go ahead. You can speak up. Don't be shy. This is a regular class. It's just that, you know, we have spectators. Imagine yourselves being on TV. This is like being on TV. Okay? Go ahead. For crew? I don't have anything. Okay, this is the first. Remember, uh, Usually, for crew has a lot to say. Remember last time how we Session. talked about that 
Um, sometimes people never hear the word of God or don't even know about Jesus, but through us, sometimes that's the only way they get to know them. So we need to be witnesses for, you know, for people to know about uh, Jesus. And, and Have you, you know, guys been witnesses to uh, friends? Talked about Jesus? And, and maybe before we start, can we just go around in a circle very quickly, just really quickly, starting from Mr. Matthew. Can we just say our name so that everybody knows who's up here? Matthew, Angel. So true. Andrew. Andrew. Ruth. Kwame. I'm Miss Juliet. Edith. Deborah. All right. And I'm Gracie. Miss Gracie. Yes, we are. So thank you so much, everybody. So did did not anybody have anything to say today? Microphone. No? I got a, I got a story I could share with you guys. Um, this Sunday, I was working on my house, and I was remodeling our house. I was hammering away in the kitchen. And, uh, and two kids, uh, well, before I knew it was kids, I heard someone's voice say, excuse me. So I pull out my head. It was uh, two 12-year-old kids, you know, close to your guys' age. Um, and they asked me if they could help me. And I said, well, it's kind of dangerous inside. You know, there's a lot of mold and stuff that I'm fixing, so it's not right for you guys. So then all of a sudden, I saw their face got sad. And, uh, and I said, well, you know what? You could probably help me in the backyard. There's a lot of backyard work to do. So I showed them the backyard, and, and then I was going to tell them I was going to pay them, you know, per hour and just help me for one or two hours. Well, in a way, I witnessed to those kids because one of the kids said, can I work on Sunday so I, so I don't have to go to church? You know, that's an excuse. So I could tell my mom that I'll work here, and, and then since she knows I'll be making money, she'll be okay with it. And, uh, and then I said, no, no, that's not good. You actually need to go to church, you know. So if you don't go to church this Sunday, I, I can't hire you. So, so then the kid said, oh, he got kind of sad, and I told him, you need to go to church. So he went to church, and he showed up the next day on Monday. And, uh, and so in a way, I was just kind of little by little witnessing them to them. Um, they're 12-year-olds, and they've worked with me for so far two days, and they're going to work for me again this Monday. But... Uh, uh, yeah, it's an example of me witnessing. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Um, Matthew. So, you know what, let's talk about heaven, because I think that's where we left off last time. If somebody were to ask you, what, what's going to be in heaven, and why should I care to be in heaven, what would you say? We should care because um, heaven is going to be more beautiful than anything on earth we've ever seen. Going. <laughs> yeah, um, in heaven you can have everlasting life and everybody will be perfect um, and there would be no tears of sadness, no one would die, it'd just be a good life. Yep. Okay, yes. We will get to see our father. We would get to see our father. I think that's about the most important thing, right? What else can we say about heaven? What are you guys excited about? What would you tell your friends? Go ahead. You can just all speak at once like you do in class. All right. We will always be happy. Okay. All right. If somebody, if somebody told you, you know what, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in heaven, what would you tell them? It's okay because it's your choice. Okay. All right. So, so if it's okay and it's your choice, that's a very good thing because we never want to push heaven on anybody. But you know what would be a good thing to do? You can tell them what Jesus did for you. Has Jesus done anything special for you? Have you had any answered prayers at all? Anybody? What answered prayers have you had? We're stricken by sadness and, and shyness, I mean. Go ahead. I don't have any. Um, I didn't get hurt this week or fall out of my bed at night. Okay, so that's awesome. And so, folks, this is just an example. Um, again, you know, shyness, kids, it happens. But in class, if you ever want to see how and what we talk about in class, please come and join us. Um, these kids can tell you all about the prophecy. 
they can tell you about Jesus and how he died on the cross. They can tell you about angels and they can tell you about how they were saved. Uh, they can tell you about why we keep Sabbath instead of Sunday. And they can tell you what makes um, the church, going to church so special and so many other things that is really above their grade level. So with that, this is just a sampling of what we were um, asked to do. Um, and at this time, I'll go ahead and thank the kids for joining us this afternoon or this morning and um, turn it back to Pastor Santos. Thank you. Let's give them a big hand. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, they are even willing to skip lunch because they are so uh, excited about what they're studying. I would peek in there and peep, they're just talking. Many of them are talking and they're just so alive and well. They just have stage fright right now. I just wanted to add one more thing. There are a few of these kids preparing a sermon. So, you know, it's, it's one of those that we just have to keep praying for our kids. They wanted to prepare a sermon, and this is just not even a fraction of the kids that we have. There are so many that are on vacation today. But do pray for our kids. They are not here just to play. They're here, and they're learning the sermon. They're watching all of you. So you are the sermon to them at times. Amen. 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 I just to say that it's a... Uh... It's actually a blessing for me being in, in, their, in the class because it's just looking at their hearts of how much they know about Jesus uh, makes me think like that's the heart we need to have, the heart of a kid. So it's a blessing for me too. Amen. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. To continue our, with our message, I want you to focus on Jesus talking to his disciples. We continue with our series, Jesus Talking to His Disciples, with the very words what we call the Great Commission in Matthew 28. He says, go therefore, and what? Make disciples. Right here, God brought through His Holy Spirit, basically, let's already start discipleship with, even with children at a young age. You don't have to be an adult. Go therefore and make disciples of what? Of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Spirit. Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to what, friends? To observe all things, right? All things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And one of the things that, that uh, I'm, I'm literally following that first word, go. We're not just to wait for people to come to church. We need to go where they are and make disciples. That's why you see me, pastor, going to different places, and we need to be going to different places and ministering in God's behalf. I'd like for us to focus on another passage in Matthew chapter 9. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. And you will see here several verses that I like to, to build also our, our topic for, this more, for today. In verse 35, it reads, And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages. This is really what Jesus did. Jesus practiced what he preached. He went to all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and notice the words here, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. By the way, the context of Matthew chapter 9, Jesus also empowered his disciples. I want you to do, go, do likewise. Go therefore, go to the villages, go to the workplaces, Find them and share the gospel of the kingdom. And you know one thing that was exciting? Jesus also gave them authority to heal all sort of illnesses and diseases. And I believe, friends, God will be doing that also for his disciples in the last days. Amen? And when he saw the multitudes, notice here. When Jesus looked out, there were many people following Jesus because they've never seen a man talk like he talked. They've never seen a man preach like he preached or heal like he healed. And they were interested what this man was about, what this Jesus was about. But he looked on the multitudes. He was moved with compassion for them because they were what? Weary and scattered. When you look into the Greek, the word is really not scattered I studied a little bit more. They were actually disappointed and discouraged. The words disappointed and discouraged because they followed various leaders who never led them to the truth. They followed various leaders who never taught them about the kingdom of God. Various leaders that gave them hope. 
to, that will strengthen their faith. So Jesus looked out in compassion with this people, this group of people looking for a leader, looking for a spiritual leader that will help them. That's why Jesus said, like sheep having no shepherd. You know, when I talk to pastors, I said, pastors, you need to, you need to lead your members. You need to equip them so they can lead others for Christ. And notice in verse 37, Jesus continues Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is what? Plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know, when Jesus looked into the congregation, he used the the, uh, harvest analogy, basically when the wheat grains would be ripe, and said, look at the fields, they're all ripe. But he was really talking about groups of people and not only in his time i believe he was looking to groups of people in all times and throughout the centuries and i believe specifically what we're talking about today in our generation in verse 38 it says therefore pray the lord of the harvest and send out laborers into his harvest i want you to see behind me the pictures of a group of people that I believe God has strong concerns about this group. They're called the millennials. Businesses are, are trying to find how can they attract this group of young people. Group of young people who were born in the 1980s to the year 2000. This group, this millennials right here, Politicians are trying to attract, and how can they attract them and get their votes? Schools and corporations are focusing on them. They're trying to answer their questions because these young people have questions. And I believe Jesus is looking through these young people because as you will see in the next few minutes, this group that we call millennials can move this world if rightly directed. And here we see We are the millennials. This group here, you will see in the studies, several interesting. What must we do to connect with them? This is the message that I preached several months ago that this group from ages basically 13, 14, all the way till 30, all of a sudden they go through a black hole and disappear when they come to church. How do we connect with them? How do we reach these talented young people, intelligent people that Jesus sees and has compassion on them? Amen. Who are the millennials? So many researchers and corporations are very interested. Who are they? How can they make a difference? How can they connect and reach these individuals? They're very unique, more than any generation before them. And here are some of the study results. We have several generations, the GI generation, the silent generation, the boomer generation, which I'm from, right here. And basically the boomer generation, many years ago, they focused on this. Business politicians did the same thing in their study to reach this boomer generation. At least uh, 75.9 million, and when generation X, it wasn't really much of a big generation, but here, This generation called the millennials is the largest of all generations of all time. And so the researchers are saying, when this group moves, we need to pay attention because market is affected, businesses are affected, science is affected. How can we tap into this group of people? And you see, friends, several of the things, what they do, some of the profiles, Dining out, uh, by the way, they used to dine out, but they're, they're really not into eating out. As you can see in their study, in their research here, according to the survey, the millennials dining out has declined over 20%, and you'll see why. In terms of using landline phones, they're gone are those days. They don't even probably know what a landline phone is, right? And so here, why? They, some of them sleep with their mobile devices. Now, how many of you millennials do that? (laughs) Some of you, huh? You sleep with your mobile devices. Here it is. Buying a house, they're not interested in buying a house. Take a look. Basically, it's not one of the most important things for them to achieve in their lives. And here's another thing. 
getting married, only 21% of them so far have been married. They wait till later on before they get married. And so here's another profile that's being said regarding getting dressed for work. They don't like getting dressed for work. They'd rather have casual Friday every day, okay, <laughs> to wear jeans. Here's another profile, buy, see, pricey clothes. They don't like that. They'd rather get uh, swap meat clothing or borrow from a friend. So you can see it's a totally different culture, totally different generation. And so when Jesus says he's had compassion over the multitude, we need to see and take a look. How can we connect with them? Jesus is interested in these people. Making a sandwich, the last person to make a 20-something sandwich was their mother. Right? A consumer found millennials are driving the growth of fast food sub-industry. So you can see... They're hungry, all right, but they're not going to go in a restaurant and spend that kind of money. I think last night in our study group, somebody mentioned, oh, yeah, we spent $11. Some of, some of my quotes in millennials saying, $11, that's a lot of money. Right. Now, valuing privacy. One of the things about the profile here I want you to see here is this. If you're going to give them a discount, they'll give you their private information so they can save. They like to save, okay? So another thing about the millennial study, they're more diverse than any other previous American generations, and this generation has hope for the future. Let me, let me unpack that a little bit more. Here in their study, you'll see they're the most educated generation. Many of them have graduated high school, have gone through their, their undergraduate degrees, and going for their master's. The most intelligent, educated generation of all the f other generations that I've shared with you. Wow. Okay? They're marrying much later. And notice the women, they're waiting until they're 25.5 before they get married. The men are waiting until they're 27.5. About 65% of the young adults cohabit at least once prior to the marriage. Now, oh, what did I do here? Can you take me back to the screen? I pressed the wrong button. Help. <laughs> Thank you. Take a look here. I got excited and so I pressed the wrong button. Let's take a look at the next portion right here. I want you to see here for a moment. On the next slide, you will see Millennials like their parents. That should be good news, parents. Amen? Amen? They want their parents' input. When they value who would be top in terms of who they respect and who they would value uh, advice from, parents number one still. Amen. I said, praise the Lord. Right. right? Even though they want their independence, they still need us. They still need you. Amen. Okay? This generation seeks the wisdom of their parents. And I said, thank you. Now, the boomers, on the other hand, have been largely self-absorbed and narcissistic. Okay? This is the boomers' world. And you can see the values that this generation takes place. Imagine the change of our nation could experience if the dominant attitude in America shifts from the entitled to giving. Millennials are givers. They want to give. Now, here you see a group of people, they are, they are a generation that wants to make a positive difference for the future. They want to make a difference to society. They want a difference in this country. And so God is raising a new generation here that is a multitude of young people. Nearly 9 out of 10 respondents indicated that they feel responsible to make a difference in this world. Amen? Amen? And here it is. God is setting the generation, my friends, that you can see the profile so far. That's why I get excited about this study. Okay, take a look. What will happen? What's going to happen with these young people? You can see from the studies, uh, they can't imagine what if they can be directed a certain way. Millennials are very hopeful. 
very hopeful for, for something. They said, well, all this education, all the money that they're going to earn or going to make, is going to make a difference in society. Simply stated, basically, they said, I believe I can do something great. So you can see this group of young people wants to do something of value. A total of 96% of them over 1,200 who were asked those, with that question. Now, boomers define greatness totally different. Take a look at this because many of us here are boomers. In terms of greatness, we define it or they define it as basically as fame, wealth, and personal power. That's why how boomers we say you want you want Greatness, that's how we define it. But according to millennials, to them to achieve wealth, fame, or power, it is the means to a greater good than to an end in and of itself. In other words, they want to be great in helping other people. It's not for because I want to be wealthy and amass many things. Something to learn about the generation and culture God is raising here. And yet, the... Millennials are very relational. They are connected. They want to be connected to their families. To, even though they may be hundreds of miles or thousands of miles apart, they will connect, whether by Facebook, Twitter, uh, texting, YouTube, you name it. This is the most connected generation of all generations they're stating. And, and you know what? I say, that's wonderful. But you think about it when you see a bunch of of millennials, they're usually looking at their iPhones, right? Have you seen that in, in whether in school, in in um, in workplaces, or in in sports uh, arena and so forth? The only time I say when you're in church, unless you're texting God, that's all right. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So here you have millennials communicate via all of these avenues. Why? Because they want to. They want to communicate. They want to stay connected. Now, interesting, as we continue, I said this part already. Let's talk about these young people. What does God want to do with them? Here is a generation poised, I believe, for something interesting and exciting in what God wants to do. But according to this research, some things have developed that was actually disturbing. And I want you to see this because as disciples and disciplers and as a church, we need to realize the people God has placed in our time. And we cannot ignore it. And for them to say these are the most important things in our lives, look at what they're saying. Number one, they said, you know what, we need help. We want to become good parents. We want to become good parents. Can you teach us? Because you know what? The model we've seen in our families is not a good model. Did you you hear what I'm saying? Because the boomers and the generation X have have basically shown a model that is dysfunctional. And said we don't want to follow the steps or make the mistakes of our parents. And here's another one. The second most important thing for millennials will be this, having successful marriage. 30% of them. And you know what? I believe it doesn't have to be for that generation. I believe for all generations, we want successful marriages, right? And I believe because, and I am thankful if those of you who were here last Sabbath, we talked about the foundation for happy marriages and relationship. And if you missed that one, please check out on the website because I believe God is trying to do that. And he, you see young people also, they're saying, please teach us. Teach us the principles how we can have happy marriages. Because what we're seeing is not what we'd like to follow. Amen. Hello? Amen? Amen? They like care. They like helping others in need. They like owning a home. It's a small percentage that we talked about. Living a religious life. Notice this. A very small percentage. 15% only wants a re- to be religious. And let's be, break this down some more. Having a high paying job is not in their radar screen. They don't want a high paying job. If they get to, be a, to, to receive a high paying job, it is because it's for the good of a bigger cause. 
having lots of free time, and look at this one, becoming famous. They don't want to become famous. Right? Take a look. One of the things the studies that have a lot was alarming was only 13% of the millennials considered any type of spirituality to be important in their lives. In other words, friends, even the anti-Christians, at least they have the Christian teachings in their radar screen. Here, when they were asked about Christianity, they haven't even thought about it. You know why? As I did a little more research, it's because of this. Take a look. Notice, I haven't thought about religion much in my life. The whole reason is because many of them would say, well, my parents only went to church during Easter and Christmas, and they claim to be Christians. And so what they see, what is modeled before them, saying, what's the importance of Christianity and spirituality, right? Is it making sense so far, my friends here? And so, in other words, Jesus is calling for a new generation of people who are committed to Jesus Christ more than any generation, right? Millennials are the least religious of any generation in modern American history. It is the least of all of them. Why? Because they're tired of all the phoniness, the artificial lives their parents or models have lived. They want to see authenticity. They want to be transparent. By the way, you ask, you ask a millennial about their personal things, they'll tell you. They're very transparent. And so in other words, friends, when it comes to faith, when it comes to, to, to when Jesus said the harvest is ripe, I'm telling you, the millennials, the largest generation of all time here, they're there. They're seeking, they're hungry for spirituality, but they, they said we need something real, we need something that's genuine, right? Now, here's something, what I call the seven habits of awesome millennials. Would you like to know? Oh, that's a weak amen. All right. You, amen? All right. Amen. Let me talk about some of the things here then. The first one, global connectors. Let me mention about global connectors for a moment here. Um, in terms of global connectors, while other people complain about the way the world was changing, the millennials took social media like fish to the water, embracing the digital world. They said, we love it. We love it. We want all the technology that we can get into. That's why Apple's business is booming. That's why some people have said, Pastor, how come you preach with media? Well, because you know what? Millennials are very visual. They want things that are connected. They want, that's why I'm trying, I've switched before. I used to just preach just with the Bible. But I'm trying to connect with a, a different generation that's so used to certain things. In order to convey the message of God, we need to also make sure we're using whatever means so we can get the message to them. Amen? Amen? Amen. Before, I was not used to texting. And now I'm a texting pastor. Amen. I'm going to I'm you. I'm going to go to Facebook. I'm learning about Facebook. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, these generation of millennials, they, they're connected to the world. If you're watching World Cup soccer, the world's in a frenzy about that. If you notice, by the way, they're all going like this. If you look at the stadium, they're all connecting. They're connecting to, to many people, their friends and family, to around the world. These are the millennials. Number two, they're defiers of the status quo. They don't like the same things the way they are. They push the boundaries to see what's possible. They're forces of social change. And you know what, too? This is the secret. Rightly implanted with the message of truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're a strong force that's going to finish the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And so here we are as members. We come from week to week. I want you to know that I'm praying and asking, Lord, help me how we can connect to this 76 million, gener- a million plus millennials. That's only here in the United States. That's not even counting uh, Canada, South America, the Western world, and other countries of the world that have similar patterns. Number three, the, the serial experimentalist. We do not live by time-tested rules because we believe in living our dreams today. They want, they want to see not only changes, they want to see things that really matter and really work. Is it really going to make a difference? Not a difference just in, in just a little thing, a difference in people's lives. I said, God is already getting the generation ready, Amen. right? Take a look, number four, they're fearless artists. Millennials know the value of their own creativity and are not ashamed to share it fearlessly with the world. You know, one thing I'm, I, I, it amuses me because now that I'm part of Facebook, people will, will post in Facebook, oh, look what I draw, or oh, I drew. They drew whatever kind of painting. It's not, it's not like a, a, a Michelangelo sculpture or a Rembrandt painting. It was a scribble. Or look at what my daughter did. And they're posting it to the rest of the world. They, they want to show creativity. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? God's work is looking for a generation who will be creative in reaching this generation with various things. It's not just a certain set of ways. That's why this coming fall. We've been praying for several months, and I'm asking God, Lord, we've had our traditional, conventional way of reaching and doing our evangelistic series. We could do that. I could do that with my eyes closed. I've been trained that way, but yet we need to reach a level and generation of people and young people and millennials and Lord, how do we do that? How do we reach that generation? Will you pray for me? In fact, I need you to be praying for that because I've asked our leadership already, he said, I need you to be praying constantly. Lord, show us the way. How do we reach them? Here's the next one, real life explorers. For millennials, the whole world is truly an oyster. You know, my son Michael have traveled around the world more than I have traveled. He is only 20 years old and he's gone to more countries than I have gone and I was I started when I was 42 many of the millennials like to travel and that's one of the things they do they basically like to to explore every inch of this world they're excited about what this world has to offer and you know what this is why the three angels message is supposed to go to all parts of the world can you imagine various cultures that we can reach when people grasp this They're economic revolutionaries. What does that mean? They want to do things they want whenever they want and provide for people we care about while not being slaves to a paycheck. You know what? In other words, friends, they're willing to reach out to other people. They don't care if anyone else noticed about it. They just want to help other people. I said, whoa, that's a precious lesson we can learn, right? And you know what, my friends, this is one of the things we need to realize. Now, I'm sure we need to realize in this church, we need need you to say, say, Lord, use me in whatever capacity it may be, right? And then freedom fighters. We define our own freedom, and the responsibility of it is also the source of our greatest fears. They want to be free, but yet... They still need guidance. They need to be directed. They don't want to be an unguided missile. Now, let me take you back now to the Word of God. We covered here, Jesus said, and he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. When I looked at the the millions of young people, are you moved with compassion too? I move with compassion because, Lord, how can we reach this generation to the point that they are so filled with the Holy Spirit, they're so hungry, hungry for the Word of God that they can be the fulfillment of what Revelation 14 is talking about? How can we make a difference in their lives, right? Here's the key. John 15, verse 5. Turn your Bibles. I'm going to spend the next few minutes to... 
the key. How do we reach this generation right here? John chapter 15. I'm not going to be flashing in much more now in the screen than after the profile has been given here. John 15. Start with verse 4. It's not on the screen here. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, Pastor, what are you, how, do, how are you connecting this? Jesus is saying the harvest is ripe, the laborers are few, right? He said pray for more laborers. And so when we pray, and I've been praying, and many people are now praying and been praying, and said, Lord, we need more laborers. What God wants all his disciples to do is this, to abide in him. Amen. Did you hear me? To abide in him, we abide in him, and he in us. Amen. Unless a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. And so in verse 5, it says here, I am the vine, Jesus reminding you are the branches. So don't worry about bearing fruit. Amen. Uh, Lord, you said the harvest is ripe. The Lord is saying, okay, how are we going to reach him? The Lord said, don't worry about bearing fruit. What you focus on basically is making sure you are abiding in Christ. Amen. Did you catch that, friends? We have the greatest challenge of reaching the millennials, but I tell you what, I'm not going to say to you, here's how you're going to line up and you're going to reach the collegiate. As I was praying and wrestling with God all week, I said, Lord, what is it that you want underlying here? And it's basically saying the words, for without me, you can do nothing. What does nothing mean? You can do anything, right? Well, you know, when Jesus was talking, he was talking to people who had, who, we were saying, well, without God, our hearts would stop beating. That's true. But so Jesus, when he was sharing this, he was talking to people whose hearts were beating. But he's basically saying something more important. Without Christ, you cannot bear fruits. Fruits, the fruit of the Spirit. Without Christ, you cannot bear fruits of obedience. Without Christ, you cannot bear fruits of transformation in your life. Without Christ, you will not have that zeal and commitment to reach other people. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. In other words, without Christ, you can do nothing. Amen. But on the other hand, there's a contrast scripture in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things, what? Through Christ who strengthens me. So here it is, a formula. Without Christ, I can do nothing, a zero. But with Christ, I can do all things. Right? So Jesus is going back to basics here. The basic is this. I was so excited when this, all of a sudden, the Lord just brought this about. You know what? All what we're doing here, it's not necessarily how can we reach the colleges, the collegiates, the young adults, the campuses. Jesus is saying, that's the wrong focus. The wrong focus. The focus is making sure you abide in the vine. You're connected to the vine. You're connected with him. Amen. Because you know what, my friends? I can't make you bear fruit by yourself, by your own skill sets. Now, I wish I had a picture here of my garden. I just started a garden this summer. It's pathetic. <laughs> a small plot. I tried to expand it. It's hard work. And I think those who know how to garden and are getting lots of fruits out of that. I was able to have a little strip there. And, and I was uh, bragging to said Alex and saying, hey, you know, my tomato plant is this big. Well, I bought it that big. When I bought it, it already had flowers and fruits. (laughs) 
I know Dr. Min knows out of garden too. I see him in his Facebook posting all this powerful, uh, wonderful produce. But you know one thing, friends? I'm learning that I have to be faithful. You know, I asked Ken Johns. He's a good gardener too. I asked, what, what is your secret? You know, what kind of fertilizer do you use and so on? Well, make sure you water it. That's a good start, right? Make sure the soil is right. Make sure you got the right fertilizer and so forth. And, and then I came, I remember just, I've been gone for, for about a week or so. We had the automatic sprinklers on and I just noticed the tomatoes that started this big when I bought it got bigger. I didn't do a thing. I didn't say, come on, grow, grow, right? By the way, they said that you should talk to your plants. I haven't done that yet. (laughs) There is a research. I'm going to share what Juliet just shared with me. I think I remember part of the story. They did a, a controlled study of rabbits that with being fed with high cholesterol diet. Okay? And what they found out, the rabbits did, because of high cholesterol diet, had high cholesterol. Except for a group of... I would think one or two rabbits did not have high cholesterol. I said, what's the, what's, why did that happen? Apparently they found out that the, the lab assistant's daughter would come and would feed them the high, high uh, cholesterol diet, but would take the rabbits and would pet it, talk to it, and just nurture it. And they didn't know they're not supposed to do that. So in other words, talking and loving those rabbits produce less cholesterol. And, and so they said, well, let me, let's do another controlled study. This time, various rabbits with the same diet, high cholesterol diet, but making sure the ones with the, the controlled now are getting the love and care, talking to them, nurturing them. Guess what happened? Very low cholesterol. And so my, my, my sweetie, Juliet, said, Honey, look, I just look what I just heard just about. I just read this. I need to love you more. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, that's right. <laughs> and so I'm going to get more loving <laughs> just because of that article, local or cholesterol. <laughs> but you know what I'm thinking I'm finding out, friends, is this. One thing I'm finding out is this. What Christ is saying, our relationships will just grow. Talk to Christ. Talk to our Lord. Tell the Lord your problems. Tell tell the Lord your stressors. Tell the Lord your dreams. Tell the Lord your, your, your frustrations. Give it to God. One of the pastors I was working with and sharing with him the principles of, 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 uh, of uh, de- de- having a deeper walk with God. He's saying, well, you know what? I just, I just put it all in my head. I said, no, no, no. Put it on paper. And talk. That way you can just tell God about it. Right? Ladies and gentlemen, if through Christ we can do all things, the biggest challenge we have is making sure we're spending that time with the Lord. Right? Take a look in Desire of Ages. We need to look constantly to Jesus. Realizing that it is His power which does the work. Right? While we are to labor earnestly for the salvation of the lost, we must also take time for meditation, for prayer, and for the study of the Word of God. That is how we connect with God. That is how we stay and abide in the vine. Amen? Amen? So the biggest challenge of millennials, I'm excited about that because we know about their profile now, even more, right? Make sure you are staying connected to the vine. My goal as a pastor, I'm going to be challenging you. I'm going to be help asking you, are you spending time with God each day? Amen. How much time should we spend with the Lord each day, Right? The more time you spend with the Lord, you know what? More fruit. 
One, one of my spiritual mentors said, more time with Christ, more oil in your lamp, more Holy Spirit in your lamp. Take a look. Only the work accomplished with much prayer and sanctified by the merit of Christ will in the end, what? Prove to have been efficient for good. Only the work accomplished, friends, is this. With what? Much prayer. Remember, three weeks ago, I preached about, about the Second Reformation, about Constantine re- releasing what we call the, the one-wing cathedral. Basically, remember that duck, the picture I showed with only one wing? God basically designed the church to be with two wings. In other words, we need that second wing that was pulled out from the Christ- early Christian church was the coming together of brothers and sisters in small groups. My friends, call to action today. Pastor, what are you telling us now? Number one, connect with the Lord. Abide with Him. If your abiding with Him is not producing much fruit, then you need to spend more time with God. Amen. Do what it needs to do what it takes to make sure if, if you're only spending two minutes a day, they said, Lord, what will it take? I need to bear more fruit. By the way, the fruit that God is looking for is the fruit of the Spirit because it is through your, when He changes your character, it is to reflect the character, the beauty of Christ's character in you or through you. Amen? Yes. So more fruits, more glory for God, more glory for Christ. And second thing, my friends, Second thing, what we need to do is get involved. Get, in, get involved in a small group. When I say in a care group, a home group, we are, we are literally, if you're part of this church, you're going to be getting a, either a phone call, an email, basically from, from me or this, this team, and saying we'd love to have you to be part of a team. Meeting, because it is only through here. Yes, we need the con- large congregation, corporate worship to the Lord, but most of all, I call it the backbone of discipleship, is making sure you're part of a weekly small group. Amen. I'm thankful for the one we had last night. We meet at least once a week. I need it too as a pastor. You need it. And you say, well, I can go without it. My friends, you can't go without it because otherwise you'll just be like a one-winged bird. And you can't fly when you just have one wing. Amen. It is because in the context of this group here, it's where God continues to work and pour out His Holy Spirit. He, that's why He said and gave the promise where two or three are gathered together, what? In my name, there am I in the midst of them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we acknowledge, Lord, from your word today. As you look in the congregation, you see, dear Lord, a group of people that you want to pour out your Holy Spirit in such a way, in such a manner, dear Father, that we can be this generation, then equip this millennials, that can help work together, hold hand in hand, and respond to that prayer, and saying, Lord, we want to abide with you. We want to be co-laborers with Jesus. But oh, dear Father, gone are the days we can just hear the message and then leave it, and do nothing about it. I pray, dear Father, our call to action that today we will respond in saying, dear Father, we will take action. We will not just sit and do nothing. We will not be complacent, but instead I pray, bring about a revival, a revival in our hearts, stir our minds, stir our hearts that we can say, Lord, unless we are part of this, unless we are are seeing growth in the fruit that is being that that your people are bearing dear father we will not be satisfied friends if your desire say lord god do what it takes do what it takes to help us connect with you and do what it takes that we may bear fruit raise your hands raise your hands up high father we need that there's a generation The biggest generation is going to be lost unless we do something about this. But I believe, dear Father, 
there's something exciting that's about to take place right here at this church, right here in Nashville. We don't want to be negligent of your calling, but instead we want you to position us so that we can honor you, we can glorify you. This is our prayer, O oh Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's close our service with... Let's sing, we have this hope. I didn't have that in the, car, in the list here. Let's, let's play, we have this hope. Can we flash that on the screen? Stand and join me now. 2.14. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the song that reminds us that we want this hope that burns, that continue to burn within our hearts. Lord, with this hope, we leave this place of worship, but we pray that your presence will be with us throughout this Sabbath day and through this week, but also, dear Father, help us to make a saving impact in the lives of people this week. Help us, dear Lord, to honor and glorify you in all that we do. This is our prayer in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen.